It is now my privilege to introduce our speaker, Nancy Blair. I'll ask her to come up shortly, but first as a way of an intro, Nancy is the director and co-founder of AIM Academy. Nancy helped to start AIM Academy 10 years ago, along with other dedicated educational professionals who wanted to help children who learn differently. The topic of Nancy's presentation will be on how children with language-based learning disabilities can thrive in a rigorous academic setting when they are taught in an environment that has trained teachers who utilize the latest research, best practices, technological resources, and expertise. The outcomes from such practices have helped children to learn how to manage their challenges while empowering them to become successful students who go on to pursue wonderful careers and uses. Please give a warm welcome to Nancy Blair. Good evening. As um, I want to thank Bill Buick and New Church Challenge for inviting me here this evening. And it is my pleasure to talk to you about language-based learning disabilities and how I learned so much about it, them. So I want to start with a few stats. And these stats are, did you know that students who do not read proficiently by third grade are four times more likely to leave high school without a diploma. That four million children have learning disabilities across the United States. And that 2.9 million students have specific learning disabilities such as dyslexia, dyscalculia, difficulty with math, and dysgraphia, difficulty with writing process. Even more important, 15% of all children in the United States have great difficulty learning to read. And that 7,000 students drop out every day in the United States from high school. That doesn't include those who dropped out prior to high school. These are scary stats. And two thirds of secondary students with learning disabilities are reading three to four levels below their peers. So when I looked at all these stats, and in, two, in 1996, I was not familiar with these stats either. But there's a little girl who came into my life, and this is my daughter, Colleen Ann Blair. And so when I had Colleen, this, she was our second child, I was not prepared. I was a nurse anesthetist. I was very happy to administer anesthesia, put you to sleep, wake you up, and off you would go. So when I started to realize that there were elements of Colleen in her learning, I had no clue that she had the pink flags and the warning signs of having a learning disability. But what she really had was red flags, and they were screaming out, but I did not know any better. I went to my pediatrician, and I said, she's not doing things at the same rate my older son is, and he told me to stop comparing my children. So what are these early signs that I was missing? And so was my pediatrician, which was even scarier. And she was speaking later than my son did. In my early married years, I got moved all over the country. So I didn't necessarily remember ages. I remembered what house we lived in when my son was doing things. And then I go, okay, Greg was this age. Why isn't she doing this? She was having great difficulty with pronunciation. Her vocabulary was nowhere as developed as my son's was. Word retrieval difficulty. If you asked her what color bike she was gonna get for her birthday, you would just see this whole confused little face. And then she would say, um, I want, it was Beauty and the Beast at that time, I want Belle's dress, blue. I had no clue that she was cueing herself to remind her of what that color was. She was unable to rhyme words easily. So those little um, nursery rhymes that everybody else is singing in preschool, 
Mine wasn't. She had trouble learning numbers. I would go over them and over them and over them. The alphabet, the days of the week, we would go over them. She'd have them, and the next day she might not. Colors, as I said, she was cueing herself every step of the way. Shapes, when she looked at a letter, it didn't dawn on her what, that it made a specific sound. And when we started to learn to read, I would just have all those little flashcards, the, and, day, say, nothing, nothing. And so little did I realize that our family's journey was just beginning. So as I started to learn more and more, I started to understand that what dyslexia really was. And then I found out it was neurological um, in, and biological in origin. Okay, I'm a nurse anesthetist. I can handle anything that's biological in origin, because that means there must be research, and it means that I will get her to the best hospital, the best doctor, and we'll follow the research, and on we'll go. Little did I realize that I would continue to search for that research. I didn't realize that dyslexia has nothing to, I shouldn't say nothing, slightly to do with letter reversal, but that's just only a few, a, a small percentage of those students. So it was difficulty with accurate and fluent word reading, poor spelling, and decoding abilities. And that all of these unexpected difficulties have nothing to do with their IQ. Nothing. And so then I went, learned more and more. And this is all by the National, um, in, uh, International Dyslexia Association, their diagnosis. The secondary consequences are that she would have could have problems with reading comprehension, and she could have, but because of her reduced reading experience, also have decreased vocabulary and background knowledge. None of this was I prepared for as a parent. Who would have known that there were functional MRIs, even back then, that showed that anatomically, the dyslexic brain shows a different um, brain development and functioning? and that there's a disruption in the posterior reading systems. Who would have known that reading disabilities are genetic and they fall in families? Because when you go to these things, they'll say, oh, who in your family has difficulty learning to read? Well, neither my husband nor I did, but I now know that his youngest brother, who had died at the age of 29 of cancer, had dyslexia, but none of us knew, and the only reason why I knew was he had written a note to my son. He gave him um, little uh, ice hockey skates, and he had written this note, and I remember saying, oh, your brother, his grammar was awful. His spelling was horrendous. He was 29 when he died. He had left this note behind, and I can still remember, we just found the note probably seven years ago, where he talked to my son and said education, he had written this note, education is the most important thing. Well, if you saw the way he spelled education, he was a college graduate, and it was scary. So dyslexia looks different in every single person, adult, child that has it. And it can appear later. So it might not manifest in all those symptoms that I just shared with you. But what it does show is that some students, oh, it looks like they're doing a beautiful job reading because they've learned to memorize every word. But guess what? That only carries you so far because none of us can memorize every single word in the English language. And the major challenges start to appear later on down the road when they're exposed to higher level text, when they're exposed to original source material, and oh, heaven forbid, if they have to write an essay and put it all together. So what can be those early warning signs that I just showed to you can be in one student, and another student, it might not appear until after third grade. So I'd like to just put this word up on the board, and it's a nonsense word, it's not a real word, but I would just like to ask can someone read this word for me? Great. Okay, excellent. Now, why did you use that C to say S instead of K? Uh huh. Why? <laughs> okay. 
Actually, you're not. <laughs> so on that piece, but the re there's a rule. And 85% of the words follow the rule. When C is followed by E, I, or Y, it will make the S sound instead of the K sound. But you probably thought in your mind, I know circle, so that's why you said it looked like a S or circus or any of those other pieces. You took other words that you knew. Why wouldn't you say serpe? <laughs> You might have thought, I know stigma, I know delta, I know Alaska. It says a, uh. it doesn't say a, it doesn't say a. Ah. But there is, when it's in that last syllable, there it'll say what we call the schwa sound, a. Uh. So the good news is 85% of our words follow the rules in the English language. And not everyone needs to necessarily know those rules because intuitively you have the wiring to lay down for to know this. But the student who has a language-based learning disability does not, and their only chance of learning to read will be with systematic instruction. So some other stats that I learned on our journey. That 75, 70 percent of third graders who read below grade level will never catch up. Well, boy, as a mom of a third grader, as a fourth grader, as a fifth grader who I wasn't seeing, like, those stats were scaring me to death. It takes four times as long to remediate reading difficulties after fourth grade. So does that mean you can't remediate after that? Absolutely not, but it will always take four times as long, which is why early screening is so critical. So when I present this aspect of it, I have just a brief time period to tell you tonight what a language-based learning disability looks like, and this took 20 years for me to develop this knowledge base. But the understanding of it is scientific. It is something that is so critical for us to pay attention to. I say this all the time. If we are showing with functional MRIs that we can show activity in the language parts of the brain with as little as nine months of intensive research-based programming, why wouldn't we do it? Medicine would never ignore that. How can we do that in education? So understanding it is scientific. The diagnosis is clinical. The treatment is files, falls within education. And the differences to each one of the students, to the adults across the United States, as well as the world, because there is dyslexia, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in Singapore, in Finland, et cetera, it is neurological in wiring, so it has nothing to do with the language. Here's the other piece that is scary as a parent because you don't understand necessarily why. There, and I hate this word, but it is what they use. It's the comorbidity, um, the components that often go hand in hand with dyslexia or language-based learning disability. ADD and ADHD, auditory processing, disorder of written expression, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, as I said, that was with math, dyspraxia, which is um, a motoric component of this. And then this is the other part that is scary. 40% of children who have language-based learning disabilities do, exhibit, do have anxiety, depression, and ADHD. Um, today at AIM, we had a um, gentleman, a doctor, a psychiatrist from Harvard School of, um, or from the medicine school, and he was talking about how anxiety and what it does to stress and what that does to the brain. And it was so scary to see elements of, he showed two slides of what the brain looks like under stress and how the neurons shrivel up when you're under stress. And so that follows whether you're in poverty, and it follows whether you're in a classroom every day struggling with something that is so difficult for you, but you don't understand why. So in the year 2000, so we're talking 16 years ago, the National Reading Panel came together at the Department of Education, and they looked at what does it take for components of an effective reading program. And this is for all students. It's not just for students who learn differently. But they realized it needed to include an alphabetic component. We needed to do phonemic awareness and phonics. And you might say, what is phonemic awareness? It is as simple as saying cat and take away the k, and I know that's at. 
but your student with a language-based learning disability cannot do that unless explicitly taught. Phonics, the putting the letters together with the sounds. I say this all the time. Who would have ever guessed, and believe me, I didn't know any of this before, and that the sound, CH, two letters, one sound. But guess what? It makes three different sounds. So usually it says CH, chin, ch. But if it's from the Greek derivative, as in Christmas or coral, it says k. And oh, by the way, if it comes from the Latin and the French, as in chauffeur and chef, it says sh. I had a little girl that I was teaching, her name was Charmaine. So everything that became a C, the sound sh, she put down as, you know, the CH. I'm like, no, no, I know that's your name. So when we, I, we laugh, I said to her, Mom should have named you something else because this just confused you even more. But we were laughing because there's elements of you can see why kids get confused. Fluency. Some people believe it looks like how many words we read per minute. I'll never forget the day my dad said to me, Nancy, we'll pay for Colleen to go for an Andrew Carnegie speed reading course. I don't care what it costs, I will pay for it. And he said, Dad, if that was as simple as it was going to be, I would have come to you a long time ago. It isn't what's going to be the answer. But fluency is the music of our language. And so it's understanding that I'm going to not say on the bed. I'm going to say, on the bed. I don't read, the ball is red. The ball is red. It's the music and it's understanding the words that hang together. It goes into comprehension. If I have to spend time learning every single word on that page and sounding it out, by the time I get to that um, end of that paragraph, I'm not going to know what it means. And vocabulary. We can teach, as educators, only 400 words directly a year. How do we pick up all the other tens of thousands that are required? The majority of us do it by reading. But if you're not reading, you're not going to pick it up. So at AIM, we did not come up with this reading rope. It's a woman named Dr. Um, Hollis Scarborough. And she was at Haskins Lab at Yale. She's actually from the Philadelphia area. She was down at Bryn Mawr Child Study. And when so many people kept on saying, what is it that takes every people to become skilled readers? At AIM, this is equivalent to our Bible. This is how we describe what it takes to get a fluent and skilled reader. So if you see at the end, it shows you a very tightly wound rope. And it says skilled reading. And what that skilled reading means, I'm independent, I don't need anybody around telling me what this means, and I can go off and ascertain all the information on this. But if you look at that rope, it has many different um, strands to it. Any one of those strands unravels, you don't have the fluent and skilled reader. So when you look at the bottom and it says word recognition, that's the element that I was talking about that I can say cat and take away the k and know it says at, that I know that that c and serpa says s and that I can look at those words and I intuitively know and I've laid down the wiring in the brain so that I can do what we call word recognition. And some people think that's sufficient. It's not enough. It's only the lower lying skills. It is not just about phonics, it is so much more. Then there's the language comprehension and the piece that just really continually um, interests us is now they're showing those functional MRIs that are showing the dyslexic brain. Those MRIs are looking the same as the child from the impoverished um, background. So if they're not exposed to the high-level language at home, if they're not being read to, they're finding that those language areas are not developing either, which is why the elements of what we do and what we support is we say we teach literacy all day long. And so we're working on improving their vocabulary, their background knowledge, and every element of that language comprehension, which is why we keep on saying, read to kids at a higher level than what they are capable of reading. Everyone should still be reading to their children all through even high school years. Enjoy the music of the language. You're modeling what it sounds like. You're encouraging them to be again with higher level vocabulary. 
So how is this taught? As I said, the answer is within the education system. It's got to be multi-sensory. Approaching it one way is not what's going to work. It's got to be systematic and cumulative. If you had sat my daughter down and said, oh yeah, Colleen, and by the way, CH usually says ch, but here, oh, there's the word Christmas in here? Well, just ignore that that I told you, because now I'm going to tell you that that'll say k. And then, by the way, we're going to talk about the little chef that made the dinner here, and that'll say sh. That would have been overwhelming. She would, have not, she would not have been able to retain any of it. The direct instruction that teachers give our children are lifelines. And what's really scary, too, is a stat I didn't put up there, is there are states in the, in the United States that are predicting how many prison cells they need based on the state's current third grade reading level. That wasn't something I could accept that my daughter's scores were going to help contribute to that. And then the diagnostic teaching and prescriptive and diagnostic instruction. Teaching matters. And I can't tell you that enough. Uh, my daughter would get awards at school at the most improved reader. And I'd say, based on what? Because she was nice? Because she was sweet? Because she tried? Or because you had data that could indicate to me what it really was that she had made a difference. And all of that instruction and all of that explicit elements builds on a child's self-esteem. Because when I tell you how many times my daughter came home in middle school and cried because she was not learning to read and she wasn't getting any better and she was so aware how the other kids were reading and she wasn't, it's very difficult to pick yourself up and keep going back in there every day. But every day, I'm like, nope, nope, we're going to do this. So what is taught and what does work for the student who has a language-based learning disability? We talk about the phonology and the phonological awareness. A sound symbol, those are not letters. They are representations of sounds. Syllable instruction. Some of you probably were taught with syllables back in the day, and they should be taught again. Morphology, I'm going to say, what is that? It's actually looking at the meaning of the words, and it is such a lifeline for most students. If we teach the Latin and Greek roots and prefixes, we can expand their vocabulary so much further. And then syntax and semantics, looking at how that word is used, whether it's an adjective, whether it's um, you know, a verb, and all those pieces, every aspect of this is critical for the step child and semantics. Who knew that the simple word, I, I remember I had a girl in seventh grade and she read fluently and beautifully with wisdom, Congress will pass the bill. So I, oh great, I have her reading this. I looked at her, I said, so Charmaine, what's this mean? And she looks at me, she says, um, Congress doesn't have enough money so they're not going to pay their bill. And I went, ah, it was a multiple meaning word. So I had not done a good job of making sure that she knew what kind of bill I was talking about. Who knew the word run? I can have a run in my stocking. I can have a runny nose. I can run to the store. And I can, um, so many aspects. Our students need to be explicitly taught all those multiple meaning words. And they're not something we can just take for granted. So here's the good news. After 20 years, and my daughter's now 25, there is so much more research. And that's the good news, and there's more and more coming out each day and each year. So reading accuracy and, um, can be greatly improved, but it can take as long as 36 months. Reading fluency can take as long as five years. And sometimes it might not totally the, act, the reading fluently still might not totally come for that student. But why I care so much on this piece is accommodations level the playing field. What do I mean by accommodations? I mean dyslexic students, adults, whatever, need extended time. They can do it, but they do need extended time. There are so many assistive technology components of things, such as Learning Ally, where um, adult volunteers read books and they can listen to them while they're following along. There are such things called the ultimate pen that students can take on special paper notes. 
if they've had it, they cannot listen anymore to the professor, they can pick up the pen, stop taking notes, and that night, they can put that pen back on that paper and it will pick up where the professor left off so they can take notes. How amazing is that? And then there's such things as dragon naturally speaking. So when I say there is so much out there, we have to make sure that the students have this type of access. We talked about the assessment of dyslexia and sadly, um, there are many states and many school districts still even in Pennsylvania that will not accept the word dyslexia. And there's a great parent organization across the United States called Decoding Dyslexia. And for the very first time, there is a charter in every state in this United States, all parent driven. And what did they do? They got together and for the very first time, I believe six weeks ago, two months ago, there was passed the READ Act, bipartisan passing in the House and the Senate and President Obama signed it, saying that we must have more and more dollars put towards higher education and teaching teachers how to teach students with dyslexia. And you know what? It was parents who did it. It really needs to be educators who are doing it too, because this is just so important. No, just like I should have said, there's no single reading center of the brain. There's also no single test for dyslexia. It's a whole combination of them put together. So what do these screenings look like? This is gonna to take too long to go over, but I'm just gonna tell you a couple things. This rapid automatic naming, who knew that when a student sees colors, said blue, green, red, how quickly they name it is another indicator of whether or not they will be able to pick up reading and the fluency of things. If single word and nonsense word reading, if you could read SERPA, then you'll be able to read other words that you don't know, such as confiscate, if you come across it. But all of these aspects of it, and then listening comprehension is often higher than um, what they can read themselves. So keep reading to them and exposing them to that. Louisa Motes, um, sadly, she's gonna be probably retiring. And she is probably one of the biggest dynamos there is. In 1999, she wrote an article called Teaching Reading is Rocket Science. You can still find it on the internet if you'd ever care to do it. And what she talked about is teachers cannot rely on their implicit understanding alone to teach reading. Explicit teaching requires explicit understanding. And so her article saying teaching reading is rocket science, we do believe that. So what are the takeaways from the science? There are brain-based differences for the students who have the language-based learning disability. Neuroplasticity is stronger in the younger student. It doesn't mean it goes away, but it does allow the intervention to be delivered under fourth grade and the changes will happen quicker. We must plan for diversity. There will always be dyslexia. Evidence-based interventions do change the brain networks, which is so critical for these students. And then we have to find their strengths because they have many, 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 but they don't think they do. And so this is one of the pictures of our eighth grade students. Um, and I say this happy kids because not all of them came to us so happy. I share with a, a young man that went to a large public school um, and he shared, we, Pat and I do something special for the seniors on Founders Day and they share different stories with us. They would make your heart ache of children saying that they were pushed to the ground in the cafeteria to clean up the floor by the other students because they couldn't read. They will share to you how they just felt such a sense of panic come over them because they were gonna be asked to read and so they knew it was their turn to go for a drink of water or go to the bathroom, anything but to read. I know this is just a very high level component of what it looks like for the language-based learning disabilities, but I want you to know there's so much more out there than when I started my journey when my daughter was five, really understanding this. I have this one link. It does take you to our website, but the purpose of taking you to our website is we have 
Um, there are probably as many as 20 to 30 resources on there, all links for you to go elsewhere. Whether it's LD resources in college, they're big. Students have a right for them. The International Dyslexic Association, whether you're a parent or an educator, tremendous amount of resources on there. Florida Center for Reading Research, um, even as a parent, if you have preschool children, they have great activities you can do at home to build the elements of the skill sets that your children need. Understood.org, interesting enough, was just recently unveiled, probably about a year ago, and it was parents of children in their 30s who put together with the experts um, chats, opportunities, because they didn't have this when their kids were in their 30s. So I really encourage you to look at that. Literacy How, a real dynamo up in Connecticut and what she's done to change her state and improve reading, married to a dyslexic, has two dyslexic children. And so the passion runs deep. LD Online, Reading Rockets, all of these are just a tip of the iceberg of what's out there and what's available. So I do encourage you to look at any of those. And then one more thing, here's the good news. So after some challenging years and fighting like crazy for my daughter, um, she graduated in May of 2015 with her master's from St. Joseph University in special ed. And she's now a literacy teacher at the Lab School of Washington, teaching children who learn differently. And she'll say to me, I am not giving up. So my Biggest to those of you who do have a child who learns differently, never, never, never give up. Because there were plenty of times that people would say, you know what, it's okay if she doesn't go to college. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. It is not okay if she doesn't go to college. So um, I ask any of you if you have questions. I hope I covered this to a little bit to help you understand what it looks like. But these kids have so many gifts. And as I said, I'm you can tell I'm pretty passionate. I'm so proud of my daughter. I'm so proud of all the pieces that she did. And the two of us, with my husband, fought like crazy on that. So thank you so much. When you say that, yes, they do say that one, number one, exercise and sleep are critical for the child who learns differently. Um, it will, if you, they're sleep depleted, if their anxiety is elevated, all those pieces, sleep and diet, but those alone would never be able to answer the components of the reading disability itself. It's that evidence-based instruction in tandem with all the other components of eating healthy. Really, there's no evidence that indicates right now that preservatives or dyes or any of those things play into this. It's a neurological. Well, I will tell you when she would get anxious, um, my daughter was a swimmer, and when she came out of that water, how calm she became. But again, that's an ex that would be an additional piece of it. It would not replace the instruction. Yes. Could you use the microphone over here? Sure. Please, Eric. Thank you. I was just thinking of an example of uh, somebody I know who grew up in a western state and he didn't cause trouble, and so if he didn't learn how to read, they didn't really care. Um, and so he, you know, he arrived at high school with almost no reading ability, and with help, how he's gone a long way. And just thinking of, you can have challenges, mm -hmm. and as you say, if you can intervene, if you can help, if you can, uh, help inspire somebody
that there is a future and a hope, it makes a huge difference. So I just um, am so impressed with your, your daughter's story and what you're doing at your school. So thank you very much. Thank you. One thing I should say to you is out of the United Kingdom came a study that 35% of all successful um, CEOs and entrepreneurs, they do believe have some form of a learning difference or ADD and ADHD. So if you look at, there's also a link of famous people who have learning differences. Charles Schwab, um, Richard Branson, I laugh his story, he always says if he understood, he was good at math, he probably would not have purchased an um, airline company. Um, you know, Charles Schwab, he didn't get diagnosed until his own son was diagnosed. And when the um, psychologist was giving the diagnosis and explaining his son, he goes, wait a minute, that's me. He says he never would have gotten to Stanford except he was, he was a phenomenal golfer and he got tutored like crazy. So there are so many successful people, whether it's um, famous jewelers, sculptors, um, they're just, there's many. And so absolutely, it's, and all of these people need to keep on being great. Um, even the actors, if you hear so many of them, um, there are quite a few. I don't know how they memorize their lines, but they do. Um, I have a comment and then a question. My comment is that um, one of the ways we motivated our son to read, he was diagnosed with mild Tourette's when he was young, and we went after his passions. So we um, got him Sports Illustrated for kids, and, and then he was really motivated to read because he really wanted to know what was in there. And I think that helped. Um, so I think it's always good to look for connections to passion or uh, ruling love. And then my question is, as you're talking and I'm thinking about comprehension and things like that, I'm wondering if at the AIM Academy, do you ever deal with the Bible? Uh, or is it just something that's uh, not a part of the program? Well, AIM Academy is, um, we are not faith-based. And I will tell you, our students come from all faiths, from all walks of life. So... Um, we honor each and every religion and allow their families to support that, but we don't bring it into the school itself. And, you know, there were days that we thought about it, but then we needed to be a school for everyone. And so that was, you know, I say this all the time, when I, my daughter was first, I'm thinking, wait a minute, same parents, same upbringing, you know, like how could this be? But, um, Learning disabilities and dyslexia, they affect all walks of life, all families, all faiths, all ethnicities. And so for us, it was important to be able to do um, all aspects of that. So, but our, do our children go back to their various faiths? Um, absolutely. And we support that. Um, I can tell you I have been to many bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and I don't understand a word of what is being said, but I will tell you that when they get up there and they talk and they'll say, so every single one of them will thank AIM because they would not have been able to be up there and share that moment. So I say all the time to be a leader in your faith. I do think you need to have self-esteem. I think you need to be able to read and I think you need to be able to contribute because sometimes when self-esteem get lowers, then you don't have that chance to be that leader and get your thoughts out to people. Oh, okay, I was given these questions. <laughs> okay, the one, these are coming from, I guess, the audience. Please tell us about the enrollment process at the AIM Academy. So when we started our school in 2006, we started with 24 students. We now have 310 and we are grades one to 12. So when you start a school in the state of Pennsylvania now, you have to go through the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So our license was as a private academic school for um, special ed. So all of our students do have a diagnosis of a learning disability based on a psychological um, assessment. So that's part of what we do when the um, 
application process comes in. And so we do have a whole team. We have our um, speech and language pathologists, our occupational therapists, our school psychologists, as well as our division heads all look at that. And then we look at do we believe that we can meet the child's needs on that piece? Because our teachers are specifically trained in language-based learning disabilities, and so that's where um, what we support on that piece. If we believe that we can support a child's needs, then we go ahead and we have the child come visit for a day. We do do some additional assessment there to see will the child fit in different academics um, groupings that we already have, because we're not a one-on-one. -on -one. We are based on small groupings, and we are college preparatory. So when we're looking at the students, it really is that they have the cognitive ability to handle the rigor of our academic setting to go on to future um, places. I will share we have 25 graduates this year that will be coming up. Those 25 graduates have received over $4.7 million of merit scholarship. We have students that have been accepted to Colgate, University of Michigan, um, a myriad of schools, uh, Croc Clemson, um, Loyola Marymount, I mean, just really wonderful schools. And then there are other students that will be going to community college. So we really do hit where the students will excel. So it's not as important to us necessarily that where they go, but that they're successful and at a college that is respectful of their learning disabilities and will allow those accommodations. Um, okay, so another one was the question, how many students can AIM accommodate? And so yes, I said we're up to 310, and we don't really want to grow above 350. We really do like getting to know all of our families. Um, you know, when it was 24, we knew everybody. We knew where all the grandparents lived, and we got to know everyone well. It's not quite as easy for Pat, the co-founder with me, to know everybody as well as we did. Expansion plans, we know that the students at AIM are the lucky ones. So what we have done is we just are going to be opening up the AIM Institute for Learning and Research. And for us, the element, we've been working with the Florida Center for Reading Research. They came in, they're looking at what we're doing to build background knowledge. They did research hand in hand with our teachers. Our teachers now just got accepted to present at the um, IDA conference with Don Compton. But we want to just keep, there's more and more to figure out what we can do and do it better. So we don't take it for granted on these elements of what we can do. So the AIM Institute for Learning and Research is going to be a component. We are working with various universities in the area as well, and we were just at the U.S. Department of Ed for Teach to Lead conference. We were ex um, 129 applicants. We were accepted as 29 to go down to possibly three tables to watch with the possibility of getting funding to support more higher education in the field of learning disabilities. As I said, we know the students at AIM are the lucky ones, but there's so many others out there that deserve this same opportunity. Okay. You tell me. It's up to you. You've got your strategic planning meeting. I know. And for, okay, one more. Two things. One was, does AIM have tours of the facilities? We do have open houses, and we have professional open houses. They're all on our website. Does AIM train teachers from other schools? Yes, we have trained 4,500 teachers um, from the area as well as we've had teachers from Spain, New Zealand, South Africa, um, Kuwait come to us for training. And this is what we do have a research symposium each year that some of your faculty have come to. And we stream that out. Um, it's gone to folks in Canada. Um, as well as other countries as well. To us, our job is to get that research out. We can't just keep it in our walls on that piece. There are, um, there is going to be a, um, we do have trainings through the summer, we do have trainings through the school year, and all of those are on the website if anyone's interested. And I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
if you have any other questions, please feel free to um, send them by email. I will admit I'm not always the best at responding to them right away, but I will try my hardest if I know the answer. So thank you. Thank you.